Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out 15 legendary London locations for music history. This video was made possible by HD Piano. Today I'm Great. going to tour you around London and show you 15 musically historic locations. Right. Starting with probably the most famous iconic musical location in London, Abbey Road Studios. This legendary oh, yes. recording studio was first opened by Sir Edward Elgar, the famous classical composer. At the time, the studio was focused on classical recordings, as you can imagine, having been opened by Elgar, but of course it became more famous later on when pop and rock acts like the Beatles wound up recording some of the most noteworthy albums of the 20th century what? here. In fact, the studio was originally called EMI Studios, even during the time of the Beatles. It was known casually as Abbey Road because that's the road it's on, but due to the Beatles record Abbey Road immortalising the location on its front cover, the studio yes. is actually now renamed to Abbey Road Studios instead. On Good the marketing. album art for Abbey Road, you can see the studio here. Now, the Beatles mm -hmm, aren't mm -hmm. the only famous act to record Abbey Road. Another iconic album to be recorded at the studio is Dark Side yeah. of the Moon yes. by Pink Floyd. So I've been to London one time, a long time ago, and me and my friends went to Abbey Road. And that's us walking across the street. I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, I've been there. And I wrote my name on that white wall in front of the studio. Which leads us on nicely to our next location, that looks familiar. London, Battersea Power Station. The distinctive yeah. building of Battersea Power Station features on the front cover of Pink Floyd's 1977 album, right. Animals. Okay. To create the album art, a 40-foot pig balloon was commissioned, filled with helium <laughs> and then flown above Battersea Power Station. Due to the risk of the balloon getting away, they also hired a marksman to shoot it down in the event of it escaping. On the first day of shooting, it was deemed that the weather wasn't good enough to get the photo. So they returned the second day, but on the second day, they hadn't actually booked the marksman. <laughs> Fate being what it is, this was the day, of course, that the pig balloon broke free and flew over Heathrow Airport, causing many cancelled flights. The pig balloon made its way all the way down to Kent, where it was recovered by a local farmer. And in fact, they then tried for a third day to get the photograph with the now recovered pig balloon, but after all that, they decided it would look better anyway by just superimposing an image of the pig over an existing image of Battersea oh, Power Station. Oh, wow. That's crazy. I had no idea that they actually tried to do it for real. This photo, like, that's that would be a good album cover right there, I think. Right? And this Power Station, it has a very timeless look to it. I didn't know it was a real place. London police are usually ready for anything, but none expected calls like those that jammed the switchboard Friday. I've just seen a pink UFO, said one caller. This large pink thing flew over my garden, said another. A third caller said, it's a flying pig. Right, so it's a flying pig. Soon a report came in from London Airport at Heathrow. The men in air traffic control said they had suspended aircraft taking off or coming into land. The reason was that a pink pig was floating gently 700 feet up across the air lane. A British rock group, Pink Floyd, wanted a different kind of cover for their new album. Hilarious. Another location in London made famous by a classic British album is this street, Berwick Street in Soho. This street Oasis? can be seen on the front cover of What's the Story Morning Glory by Oasis. Right. Very close to this location is various other spots that have a musical heritage to them. For example, here at 17 St Anne's Court, from 1968 to 1981, this was the location of Trident Studios, where Whoa. many classic British tracks were recorded, including Hey Jude by The Beatles, Your Song by Elton John, David Bowie recorded his Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust album here, Queen recorded wow. Queen, Queen 2 and Sheer Heart Attack here, and Lou Reed recorded Transformer here. Trident Studios was famous for its particularly bright sounding Beckstein piano, which I actually made an entire video about before, which you can find in the description. Just a moment ago, I mentioned that Bowie recorded his famous Spiders from Mars record here at Trident Studios. And in fact, only five minutes away, we can find the location where the legendary album art was created for this album. Mm. It was here on Hedden Street, just off Regent Street. Literally on the other side of this building is another very famous location in London for music, 3 Savile Row, the location of the Beatles, Beatles Applecore headquarters building where on the 30th cool. of January 1969, the Beatles gave what would be their last ever live performance on the rooftop of this building. So Hedden Street, where the Ziggy Stardust album cover was shot, would definitely have been an earshot of the Beatles' performance. Hmm. If you watched the 2021 Beatles Get Back series, you would have seen a lot of this Apple Corps building, Three Savile Row. It was in the basement of this building where the Beatles were recording much of their Let It Be album, 
And then on the rooftop on the 30th of January, they then gave a live recording session where they tracked many of the songs that would wind up on the album. I didn't know that building was still standing. I thought they tore it down. I heard of Trident Studios, but I didn't know that's where it was or what it looked like. Is that a historical landmark sign? Oh, it says David Bowie. Okay, I guess because of Ziggy Stardust. I guess I always thought they tore this building down, and I guess now it's Abercrombie, Abercrombie and Fitch. I wonder if the people who work there realize that in the basement was where Let It Be was done. I thought they tore it down. Anyway, moving on. We're now going to head over to Brook Street, where we have three different musical points of interest. Firstly, at 67 Brook Street is where Bee Gees manager and producer Robert Stigwood lived from 1968 to 1980. That's 1980. a nice place. The Bee Gees spent a lot of time at this location and wrote many of their classic songs here. Hmm. Then if we move up Brook Street, we find number 25 and number 23, which today have actually been merged into one property, one museum. Property. And that is because two very noteworthy musicians lived here. In the 1720s, Baroque composer George Handel lived at number 25 wow. Brook Street. Handel composed most of his works here in this room, what? including his famous Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Then, purely coincidentally, almost 250 years later, another groundbreaking and foreign-born musician would make their career here in London on Brook Street, Jimi Hendrix. From 1968 to 1969, this was the home of Jimi Hendrix. Now, Hendrix was actually aware that Handel had lived next door, hmm. albeit over 200 years ago, because the blue plaque was already on the wall. Reportedly, Hendrix wasn't familiar with Handel prior to moving in, but after learning that Handel had lived next door, Hendrix actually purchased a record of Handel's Messiah and became a fan of Handel's work. Beyond living in houses next door to each other, one of the other interesting parallels here is that both Handel and Hendrix were not native to Britain, Handel being German and Hendrix being American, but it was here in London that they both made their name. That's amazing. Right next to each other. What a coincidence. I want, I want to go there. I want to, I want to live there. Heading back over towards Soho again, we visit Denmark Street. In the first half of the 20th century, Denmark Street was considered the Tin Pan Alley of Britain. It was on oh. Denmark Street where the offices of many music publishers and journalists could be found. By the 1960s, Denmark Street became more of a hub for the new rock and pop music scene. Number four Denmark Street was where Regent Sound Studios was, where many classic pop and rock artists would cut demos and even full albums. For cool. example, in 1964, the Rolling Stones recorded their first album here. A couple streets over Sounds on Old weird. Compton Street, we can find the location of the Two Eyes Coffee Bar, which from 1956 to 1970 was a hub for Britain's emerging rock and roll scene. It was while hmm. performing at the Two Eyes Coffee Bar that major British stars like Tommy Steele were first coffee. discovered. Just one minute's <laughs> walk from where the Two Eyes Coffee Bar was, we can find London's most legendary jazz club, Ronnie Scott's. Along with fellow saxophone player Pete King, in 1959, British saxophone player Ronnie Scott opened Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club. Ronnie Scott played on many classic jazz albums, but even if you don't listen to jazz, you've probably heard Ronnie Scott play because he also provided saxophone for Phil Collins' I Missed Again from his Face Value album. And most significantly, you can hear Ronnie Scott playing his sax on <sighs> Lady Madonna by The Beatles. <sighs> First thing I want to point out, coffee to eye. These rock stars are drinking coffee, y'all. They're not drinking tea. Is he still around? Is he still alive? Is he still, is he still blowing? No, he died in 1996, two days before Christmas. Rest in peace, Ronnie Scott. He died at 69. <laughs> wow, back when people used to go out and see live music regularly. He would be the MC apparently, and one of the jokes was, our next guest is one of the finest musicians in the country. In the city, he's crap. That's funny. Ronnie's funny. I would have liked to have met Ronnie. Seems like a happy guy. And from those sax parts in Lady Madonna, he sounds playful, you know? You, you can hear it. Just opposite 47 Thrift Street is 20 Thrift Street which is associated with a different musical style, classical music, because it was here, mm -hmm. at the age of eight, during his 1764 tour of Europe, that Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart lived, along with his mm -hmm. father and sister. 
In fact, before staying here, the Mozarts had been staying Hang at on, a different what? address in London, 180 Ebury. Mozart lived there? Right there? That can't be the same building. It looks like it was built in the 40s. Maybe it is the same building. Wow. Mozart lived across the street from Ronnie Scott. I don't think Mozart ever lived in Los Angeles, so this is interesting to me. And it was at this location that the eight-year-old Mozart composed his first ever symphony. What? And today there is a statue just down the road to commemorate this. Hell, I had no idea Mozart lived in London. I just thought he was in Vienna his whole life. I want to go to Mozart's house. Next, we head over to the famous Savoy Hotel, but not to the front door, but instead to this alley behind it. it was Is that where they do... I think I did a reaction to tea? Like, high tea? And it was at the Savoy Hotel, is that right? Is that possible? I'm not going to look it up. I'm going to assume that's what it is. Savoy Hotel, but not to the front door, but instead to this alley behind it. It was here in 1965 that Bob Dylan filmed one of the earliest examples of what could be described oh, as a music video the for his song, Subterranean Homesick Blues. Yeah. The famous film clip was originally part of a documentary following Dylan's 1965 tour of England. Although it's a little hard to make out the likeness today, you can still oh, see the like brickwork of this church on the right of where Dylan is standing. Not too far away from Abbey Road, we can find hmm. two more Beatles-related locations. First is this one, 34 Montague Square in Marleybone. The ground floor flat here was leased by Ringo Starr during the 1960s, and many noteworthy musical things happened here during that time. Paul McCartney recorded a demo of the song I'm Looking Through here and worked on the song Eleanor Rigby. Jimi Hendrix composed his song The Wind Cries Mary whilst living here wow. for a while. And for a three-month period, John Lennon and Yoko Ono lived here. And it was in this flat that they took the infamous nude photograph that would oh, serve as the cover right. of their Two Virgins album. Very cool. Strange how these locations are kind of clumped together. How Jimmy lived next to Handel, and then Ringo, Jimmy, and John all lived here. So wild to think of them living just right there, right off the street. If you stood on the sidewalk, you could scream and they could hear you. It's really weird. I guess there are places like that now. I walk by Jack Black's house a lot. If I screamed, he could probably hear me. But I don't want to creep him out, you know? A couple minutes walk away on Baker Street. Yes, that Baker Street. We can find the location where the Beatles Apple Boutique was. The Apple Boutique oh, was a fashion right. store opened by the Beatles, but unfortunately proved that the Beatles weren't quite as good business people as they <laughs> were musicians. Opened in December 1967, the shop closed only eight months later in 1968 mm. after losing almost four million pounds in today's money. Ooh. Ow. Ooh. In how many months? Eight months? The shop closed only eight months later in 1968 after losing almost four million pounds in today's money. Ah, oh, that would hurt. Ouch. I always wondered why they closed that down and now I see why. And for our final location today, we head up to Putney, to the side of this road, Queen's Ride, where on the 16th of September, 1977, Mark Bolan, songwriter and singer of glam rock band T-Rex, tragically died in a car crash just days uh... before his 30th birthday. Mark Bolan was in a relationship with Gloria Jones, who is a famous musician in her own right, perhaps best known for performing the original version of Tainted Love. Oh, Tainted Love. The couple had both been drinking, and Gloria Jones was driving them back home. It was at this location that Jones lost control of the car, leading to a car crash that Damn. killed Mark Bolan. Mm. And today, the location is marked by this shrine, where many T-Rex fans have left tributes to the iconic singer-songwriter. So there's a whole range of musically historic locations around London. If there's any other locations around the city, or around the UK in general, which have a significant musical history to them, then do let me know in the comments down below, and maybe I- I'm sure there's a hundred more. This is a great video, really interesting. Y'all, we need these public pianos in America. I'm afraid though if they weren't bolted down they would be stolen. Or destroyed. Now I want to go to London again. I missed all this stuff the first time. Great video, David Bennett Piano. Be sure to subscribe to his channel or go check out some more videos if you're into music and pianos or David Bennett himself. This was great. Thank you all for watching it with me and I'll see you all next time. Later.